This video was sponsored by HelloFresh. Oh, hi there. In this video, I'm going to start building a wall in the Airstream. It's a real big pain in the butt, so follow along and see how terrible it was. Oh, also check the link in the video description for Patreon, our second channel, Bourbon Bites, cool swag on the website, products, different stuff we used, my favorite color. Now that we have the back bed nearly complete, we gotta start thinking about a wall to divide the back bedroom from the rest of the Airstream. One side will be the bathroom, one side will be the kitchen, and there's gotta be an opening, obviously, to crawl into bed. The only question I have is how the heck do you build a wall inside of a curved RV? I have Absolutely no clue, but that's never stopped me before. The first thing I needed to do was figure out exactly where that wall needed to land, which is right at the end of our bed. So I went and grabbed the laser level, I slapped that thing on the floor, and it gave me a nice straight line all the way around the inside perimeter of the airstream. Next, I ripped down some strips of quarter inch ply to see if they would make the bend around the inside, and fortunately enough, they would which meant that I could start with just thin strips of quarter inch, I could bend them around the entire area of which the wall needed to land, and then my thought process was I could just keep adding layer upon layer of quarter inch until I built it up to a level that I could attach other things to, I guess. Now before you say I'm making this too complicated and I should just use a sheet of plywood and call it a wall, this wall is technically gonna be a wet wall, meaning it's gotta be wide enough that I can run plumbing and pipes in the interior of the wall for the drain for my sinks and the vents for my gray tank and my black tank that will eventually go out the roof. So the wall had to be thick enough that all that stuff would fit inside. I decided on three inches. I don't know why, it just seemed like a good width. So after I got two pieces of quarter inch spanning the entire interior of the Airstream, I just screwed them into the sidewalls with some sheet metal screws, right through the skin, because the whole skin of the inside of the Airstream is in fact just sheet metal. So that made it pretty simple. Once I worked my way all the way around, screwing my first layer of quarter inch firmly in place with those sheet metal screws, then I could, well, do the exact same process over again, just go cut more quarter inch plywood first. I figured if I did three layers of quarter inch plywood bent around the interior, that would bring me up to three quarters of an inch. Essentially, I'm making my own three quarter inch ply on the inside for the framework of my wall. So after getting my first layer screwed firmly to the outside, now I'm gonna start gluing layer upon layer until I build up to that three quarter inch thickness. So I smeared some glue onto another piece of that three quarter inch ply and very carefully, so that I didn't get glue all over the place, I bent another layer into place. This made me a little nervous because I still had no clue whether or not this was actually gonna work. And by gluing that piece of quarter inch onto my first piece of quarter inch that was screwed in, I'm essentially making the decision right now that I will never remove these pieces from the inside of the Airstream because that would be a royal pain in the butt. So here goes nothing, let's hope it works. After getting my second layer completely glued on, you guessed it, I moved on to my third layer until finally I had three quarters of an inch of plywood wrapped around the whole inside. Now what? That's a great question, Jason. And I don't quite know the answer, but we'll figure it out. Now, based on the depth of the kitchen cabinets that I will eventually build and the depth of the bathroom that I will also eventually build, I knew exactly where the hallway or entrance into the bedroom needed to be. There was just one problem. How are you supposed to make something square when there's no square surface to reference off of? I had absolutely no clue. I mean, I could go off the floor, 
but the floor is not exactly level. So if I go off of the floor up to the ceiling, is it going to be square? I don't know, maybe. And I can't measure off the wall or the ceiling because that's just a giant curve. So after thinking about it for a while, I decided the only way to make my doorway into the bedroom perfectly square was to, well, start with a square. Or, in this case, a rectangle. I went into the shop and I cut a strip of plywood that was the exact width I wanted for my doorway. Now I knew this piece of plywood was perfectly square because I checked it and, well, it's square. Next I took that piece and I clamped it to my two vertical pieces I cut previously. My thought process behind this was that it would allow me to get the doorway nice and square and it didn't matter what the outside of the Airstream was, as long as that one section, dare I say it again, was square. So after getting both my boards on either side of my piece of plywood cut to the correct length, I marked on the top of my framework exactly where those needed to land so that I could bring them back in and I wouldn't have to fuss around with the board and the clamps again. Now, when it came to connecting all these pieces together, I thought, maybe I'll hand cut some mortise and tenons. No, I'm joking. I never for a second thought that. It was always going to be pocket holes because it's quick and easy and you're not going to see any of this joinery. It's on the inside of a wall. So after adding some pocket holes to both ends of those vertical pieces, I took them back into the Airstream and using my marks that I added earlier, I screwed them into the ceiling. Then before I screwed them to the floor, I brought back in my square piece of plywood and I clamped it onto both of those vertical pieces. This ensured that they were coming straight down. Yes, square and parallel to one another. Now that I had both of those pieces in place, I screwed them to the floor and I kept that plywood in there until I could add some additional bracing. So I cut a brace piece to put at the top of the door and I screwed it in from both sides. And then I started just cutting and adding brace pieces on the left and the right. Really no rhyme or reason at all. It's not like I was spacing them out evenly, 16 on center like you would on a traditional wall. I was just chucking them in there willy nilly. Because as far as I knew, there wasn't any specific code for the internal structure of a wall inside of a 1965 Airstream or 63, whatever year this is, I don't even know anymore. Pretty soon I had what I assumed was an adequate amount of bracing around that door, which meant that I could now take off this sheet of plywood and hopefully everything would stay nice and, I'm gonna say it again, square. And that's the story of how Jason made a square opening inside of a round tin can. Even Ivor was pretty impressed. He came in with his Foreman Instruments, aka Power Ranger Guns, and gave it the once over. He did say that I had quite a mess on the floor and I should probably pick that up. Typical Foreman. Now back to the reason why this wall had to be so thick. Here is the pipe that's connected to my gray tank. So I need to take one of those splices and eventually hook it up to my bathroom sink for the drain and the other one's going to go up and out the roof for the venting of the tank itself, which means I have to run all that piping through this wall, which is why I had to make it so thick. I'm actually going to make this wall accessible through some removable panels on the inside of the bathroom, but I still wanted to take the time and make sure all my piping fit through the wall the way it needed to. Sure enough, it did, so I'll come back and finish hooking all that up later. For now, I've got more walls to build. Well, actually, it's the, the same wall, I just am not done building it yet. Now, I could have made things very simple. I could have made a wall that went from the floor up to the ceiling and called it good. But for some stupid reason, I got it in my head that it'd be cool to make an arched doorway. Yeah, idiot move, which meant I had to do some more kerf cuts over on my miter saw so that I could form an arch in the doorway. Now, I wanted to cut these curves and bend it in a way that the veneer was on the inside or the visible side and the ugly curves were on the outside. The only problem is that when you cut curves, they don't generally want to bend that way. I thought maybe if I cut them deep enough, I could get away with it because I would thin down the actual veneer on that bottom side and maybe it would bend. 
As you can see, that did not work out so great. Instead of bend, it just snapped apart. But did this mean I gave up and changed the way I was going to do things? Absolutely not. I decided it must have been, you know, a failure in the wood or I didn't have them cut to the right level or consistency. So I went back into the shop and I cut a whole new piece. Kerf after kerf after kerf, and for whatever reason, I told myself this time it will be different. This time it's gonna work. And back into the airstream I went with the confidence of a fool. And this time, well, obviously, it did the exact same thing because kerfs don't want to bend in that direction, they just want to break. So, after failing miserably two times in a row, I finally decided the only way this is going to work is if I just flip it around and have the exposed kerfs on the inside. Will this make all those ugly kerf cuts visible? Absolutely. But I'll deal with that later, once I get my arch cut out. So, once again, it was back into the wood shop to cut more kerfs. Not only did I decide to flip it around so that it would bend easier, I also decided to cut a much shorter piece so that I wouldn't have to manhandle this big, awkward, long, full-length strip of plywood. This would allow me to be much carefuler as I bent it. Carefuler? I don't even think that's a word, Jason. I think the phrase you're looking for is more careful. Oh yeah. <laughs> This allowed me to be more careful as I bent it inside the opening of the doorway. Now I marked the dead center of my curved cut piece and I drew a center line on the inside of my door opening so that I could line up the two. Then all I had to do was evenly push them up from the outside and I could adjust how extreme or not extreme of a arch I wanted. So I played around with that for a while until I got what I thought was a nice looking arch that somewhat mimicked the opening of the main door on the airstream itself i mean we might as well stay consistent then i cut some straight pieces of three quarter inch ply to go underneath that curved cut piece and complete the arch ensemble but there was still one big issue those ugly exposed curved cuts on the top of the arch now, lucky for me, I happen to have this 8th inch Baltic birch laying around, and I thought, just maybe, it might be thin enough that without any kerf cuts, I could still bend it around the profile of that arch and use it to veneer over all those ugly kerf cuts. So very carefully, I started to bend it, and very slowly, trying not to go too fast, I worked it into position, bending it in between the opening of my door. And then all of a sudden it's, well, it fit and my idea worked. What did you think I was going to say? You thought I was going to say it broke, didn't you? You expected me to say that it broke. You have no faith in me. What, you don't think every once in a while one of my ideas can work? Come on, man. Show a little faith, bunch of jerks. As you can see, with this nice 8th inch veneer, all my kerfs are going to be hidden forever. Oh, hey, this video is sponsored by HelloFresh. You know why they call it HelloFresh? HelloFresh. I don't know if that's true, but that's why I call it HelloFresh. Anyways, the reason I love HelloFresh is they make it incredibly simple for you to have good quality meals at the end of the day. And they're so easy to make that one of my favorite things to do is to make them with my son because he's getting into cooking right now and they're just easy to make. So we're going to go inside and we're going to make some yummy food. Follow me. This summer, HelloFresh is here to take the work out of eating well. Reach your goals with delicious calorie smart and protein smart lunch and dinner options, plus new vegan recipes too. Figuring out what's for dinner is not at the top of anyone's summer activity wish list. HelloFresh delivers mouthwatering chef crafted recipes and fresh ingredients to your door so you can spend your summer doing whatever the heck you want. Do you need dinner ready like right now? Look for quick and easy recipes on the HelloFresh menu, including fast and fresh options ready in just 15 minutes or less. 
HelloFresh isn't just easy and convenient, it's fun for the whole family. My son loves coming in the kitchen and helping me cook dinner, and HelloFresh makes it so incredibly simple that he can basically do it all by himself, which is great because it's high time somebody else cook for me for a change. So, if you think HelloFresh is something you'd like to try, which I highly recommend you do because it's just as delicious as it is easy to make, then go to HelloFresh.com and use the coupon code BourbonMoth16 to get 16 free meals plus free shipping, which is a big deal because shipping's kind of their whole thing. I mean, it arrives to your door via shipping, so the fact that you get free shipping is pretty good. Oh, clamp in the back. Ugh. Now that I knew my 8th inch Baltic birch would make that curve and cover up those kerf cuts, it was time to firmly glue it in place. Now, I knew I was going to have to wiggle this around for a little bit and get it just in the right position, so I didn't want to use traditional wood glue because I wouldn't have as much of an open time. I also knew that this bend was going to be under a lot of strain, so I opted for Total Boat Thick Sew. It gave me more open time, and this stuff is crazy strong. So that's, you know, an added bonus on top of all those other things I said. With my veneer piece all thick sewed up, once again, I slowly bent it into place, thinking that for sure, because I already did this, it would have no problem bending a second time. And that's when, I'm just kidding, it worked the second time also. I tried to make you think again that, that maybe this time it would break, but it didn't. I loosely clamped it on both sides, just enough to add some friction, and then using a block and a hammer, I pounded it up into place and tightened those clamps down. That's really the only clamping I needed all the way around. It stayed on there pretty secure, and I took a paper towel and wiped off any of the excess squeeze out. Now because I added an eighth inch veneer at the top of the curve, even though I really didn't need it for aesthetics, I had to add an eighth inch veneer at the bottom so that everything would be, you know, nice and smooth and level and there wouldn't be this weird step down of plywood inside the arch. So I cut a few strips of the eighth inch veneer and I added one on either side. Now the entire framework of our wall was complete. Did I make it way more complicated than it needed to be? Oh, absolutely. I'm sure there was a much simpler way to do this, but I also don't know what I'm doing, so I tend to overcomplicate things. The next morning, I came out and started removing all of my clamps. And because you probably don't know what it looks like for someone to remove clamps, I thought I'd put way too much footage of me removing clamps in this one section. Now, I know a lot of you are looking at this wall and saying, why did you make the doorway so small? That's going to be such a pain to get through. Look how tight it is. But let me just show you, all right? I can walk in here. I can stand completely up straight without hitting my head. I can lean forward and backward. I can go in the bedroom. I can come out of the bedroom. It's really not that big a deal. And if you think that that doorway is small, well, just look at this doorway. This is the actual front door to the Airstream and it's way smaller. I can't even get inside of it without having to bend down or I'll hit my head. So quit saying the doorway's too small and just enjoy the rest of the video. Now that the framework for the wall was complete, I had to cover the entire thing in quarter inch ply, which meant that I had to cut quarter inch ply to perfectly fit the shape of the inside of the Airstream. How was I gonna do that? Well, I had absolutely no clue. I started with a rectangular piece of eighth inch Baltic birch because I like to use this material to cut templates because it's lighter and it's really easy to cut. And then the next obvious thing was to grab this plastic tennis ball launcher that I use with my dog, because that made sense, and a Sharpie. Because when I was racking my brain trying to figure out how a professional would scribe this curb, plastic tennis ball launcher was the first thing that came to mind. I mean, really, I just needed something long and straight, and this was sitting right outside the door, so I grabbed it. I taped the Sharpie onto the base of the launcher, and then I basically used it as a giant scribe just to kind of trace the inside curve of the Airstream. 
Now I was well aware that this wasn't gonna be anywhere close to perfect, but you get a little bit closer and a little bit closer and then eventually you can do your final scribe and get it perfect. So after tracing that line, I went into the wood shop and I cut it out on the bandsaw. Is this gonna work? No clue. Then I carried it back into the Airstream and as I expected, it wasn't anywhere close to the right shape, but it was closer. Then I got rid of the tennis ball launcher and I just pinched the marker in between my fingers and made the patented finger scribe. Ooh, ah, this is the four finger scribe. You can also use a three finger or a two finger, but I prefer the four finger. Then it was back into the wood shop to once again cut my scribe line. Then it was back into the Airstream to hold it up and see that, well, we're a little bit closer. Now that we've got fairly close, I switched to an actual scribing tool. Now the reason I used a scribing tool and not my fingers like I normally do is because I needed to be able to set the scribe at an exact distance from the edge of the wall. So I could duplicate this line later. And if that doesn't make sense, I'll explain it here in just a second. So I took the scribing tool and I traced the entire inside shape of the ceiling and down onto the wall. But you might have noticed as I was doing this scribing that I'm never going to get it perfect if I keep scribing this way and cutting to my line. Because if I remove material at the top, it'll push it closer to the top. But I'm also removing material at the side, which means it's going to slide over. And when it slides over, then it's not going to fit on the top. And every time I scribe on a curve like this, it's always going to do that. So this is where that scribing tool comes in handy. Because I had it set an exact distance away from the ceiling, I scribed my line and I cut it out on the bandsaw. But instead of taking my piece back in the Airstream and wondering why it doesn't fit, I lay my piece out on a new scrap piece of plywood. Then with my scribe still set to that exact same distance, I now scribe off of my freshly cut scribe and I'm basically adding that material I just took off back on. But this time the material that's being added back on is the exact shape of my scribe, or the inside of the Airstream. Did that make any sense at all? I mean, it made sense to me, but I'm also the one that did it. So if it didn't make sense to you, we'll just go rewatch it 12 times. Not because I want you to understand, but because I could really use the engagement and the views. Anyways, after doing my new scribing technique, now you can see that I had a pretty tight fit against my wall and ceiling. So continuing on with this method, I just slowly started cutting pieces and fitting them on the wall as skins. Now you might also be saying, why aren't you using bigger pieces? Aren't you gonna have a lot of seams if you're using all these little pieces? Well, these are still my eighth inch pieces that I'm just gonna use as a template. Then I glue one piece on the front of that to make a larger piece and voila, now, I have a big template that I can use to cut out my final piece from quarter inch Baltic birch. So into the shop I go with my eighth inch template, I plop it down on a sheet of quarter inch ply, and then I trace it out and I cut my final piece. Now because I want my final piece to be exactly the same shape as my template piece, I cut with a jigsaw about an eighth inch off of my pencil line and then using my Rotex sander, I cut my entire scribe line very carefully, just bringing that edge up to that pencil line. Now I have a nice big piece that I can carry inside and what do you know, it fits just the way I wanted it to. Now, there were a lot of these pieces that I had to cut, and I'm not going to take the time to walk through every single one of them with you because between you and me, well, it's just the same process over and over and over again. So I started just cutting out pieces and piecing them together. Now, you're looking at this thinking, there's a lot of seams in there. Aren't those going to be ugly? Aren't you going to see them? Well, no, you're not. I have plans to cover up all these seams. For one, on the right-hand side there, there's gonna be a wall that's gonna make up the bathroom. So you're not gonna see that seam. And the seam on the left-hand side, well, there's gonna be kitchen cabinets there. So you're not gonna see that one. So just calm down. 
Now that I had all the pieces cut and fit for the front side of my wall, I labeled them all so I could remember which was which, and I carried them into the shop. Now because my wall is only three inches thick, I thought it was a pretty safe bet that I could use these pieces as templates to cut identical pieces for the back of my wall. So after laying all these pieces out, roughly the shape of my wall, I started grabbing them one by one, throwing them on a new sheet of quarter inch plywood, and basically just duplicating that piece. So now I would have skins for the front of my wall, and I would have skins for the back of my wall. And yes, in the process of doing this, I made a big, big mess all over the floor of my shop. But the good news is I've got a lot of quarter inch plywood scraps, because that's something I need more of. Now that I had all the pieces cut for the front and back of the wall, it was time to start hooking them in place. And before you say anything, no, I'm not permanently hooking them in place. I'm actually going to do this temporarily because once I get them all in place, I'm going to pull them all back down but I probably won't get to that step until the next video. For now, I just have to cut the exact shape of my archway. Now to hook them in place, I'm gonna be using these white pan head screws. Now you might be asking yourself, white pan head screws of all the ways to attach these skins to your wall, why white enamel pan head screws? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm not gonna tell you. You're just gonna have to wait until next time to figure out why I use those. Anyways, once they were temporarily attached with those screws, I grabbed a flush trim router bit from Bits and Bits. I chalked it up in my trim router, and using the inside curve of that arch as a template, I cut my exterior plywood to perfectly match the shape of that curve. And to say this was satisfying would be an understatement. I mean, look at that. Don't you just want to be me right now? Don't you wish you were the one sitting there cutting this perfect curve? I'm not gonna lie, it was pretty darn enjoyable. Ooh, ah, satisfaction. And dust, I mean, look at me, I'm flipping covered. Ugh. With the back of my wall completely skinned out, now all I had to do was the exact same thing on the front of my wall. Thankfully, all my pieces fit the way they should, because I spent way too much time making sure that they did. And again, I know you're looking at this and you're like, what about that one strip there that doesn't have plywood? And please just believe that I have a plan. All this will be covered up and look wonderful in due time. That time's just not right now because, well, I ran out of time because everything takes longer than you think it will in an Airstream. If you don't believe me, go buy a flippin' Airstream and try and build it out yourself and then come back here and complain that things are taking so long. I double dog dare you. Once again, I cut out the arch on the front of the wall and then just to make all you viewers happy for now, I added in a tiny little strip of quarter inch plywood so that at least everything was on a level playing field. Hey guys, what's up? Well, I did not get as far as I wanted to in this video, but that seems to be the theme of this whole Airstream build. I have plans, I have intentions, I start working, and everything takes longer than I think it will. Now, you're probably looking at this and you're thinking, this doesn't look that great. There's all these seams everywhere and it's just plain plywood. Well, just wait till the next video because I'm going to take this thing from okay to you know, a little bit better than okay, if I can. So come back next time and try and make this look cool. Also, there's a link down in the video description for our Patreon website. If you don't know what that is, I encourage you click that link. In just a few weeks, we're heading over to the East Coast for one of our biannual Patreon builds. Basically, one of our patrons Twice a year wins a chance for me to come out to their shop and build a project with them. So if you want to know more about that or just see what you're missing out on on Patreon, click that link down there.